Hello everyone, thank you very much for joining me today again. Um, we discuss technical debt today. It's a very important subject for any software developer and IT manager. Uh, and I hope you will enjoy the talk. If you are watching the event live, don't forget to have a live chat there. And I also say hi to all of you and thanks for all your appreciations. Uh, if you are watching the event recorded, you can still ask your questions in the comment section and don't forget that you can anytime follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn and other social media. Um, yeah, I was saying today's discussion is about technical debt uh, and also the fact that I consider this to be very, very important, essential for anyone working in, uh, in software delivery. Um, and I want to um, raise a few things about technical debt. You might know some of them. You might not necessarily know the others. And I will enforce this uh, with some stories, some, some real world stories from my experience. Uh, so it, it might be very interesting for you to follow me and of course, raise all your questions and start discussions in the live chat. So with that being said, and skipping over uh, my um, presentation because you already probably know me if you are here. So I wrote a few books and you can find me on social media. Uh, today we discuss technical debt. What exactly is technical debt? So uh, many people, many developers especially, tend to see technical debt as kind of sickness in, uh, in a software. And, and it, it is kind of a sickness, but I will today show you also a different perspective on technical debt. So let's start from how usually technical debt is being seen and what are the things that you should know in terms of its attributes and then discuss if you need to avoid it or whether you can actually use it. And you will see that there are cases and cases, there are situations where you need to avoid technical debt and situation where you need to use it if you want to be efficient in your software project delivery. So is technical debt some kind of a sickness? Uh, yes, you can see it like you can actually imagine it uh, like um, uh, fat on your veins or arteries. Um, it tends to uh, accumulate and you can have uh, because of that you, you can have a uh, a high heart pressure uh, but usually what happens is that the body knows how to manage it so if you have a strong immune system and if you have a strong healthy body uh, you will not have a problem because even if it will continuously exist your body will fight against it and will keep your cholesterol and fat at a, a level that is normal um, so that's you will see that's what happens also in software, in well-managed software with technical debt. So yes, you can consider it and you can make an analogy between this uh, subject and an illness, but you will see that you can also have a, an economic perspective about technical debt that we will discuss later. So what you should remember about technical debt's characteristics is that it, it, it always grows. You will never see technical debt staying. Uh, technical debt, it, it actually grows. Even if you don't change your application, some people, some developers believe that if you have an application and you, if you don't change it, it means that the technical debt stays there at the same level. And this is not true. It actually, with time, even with a software that doesn't change, either a library or uh, even a service in your, in your say, service-oriented uh, uh, ecosystem, if you don't change it, technical debt grows. How can technical debt grow if you don't change the software? Well, it grows through the fact that the technology has become older and with older technologies in time, it's much difficult to implement over them with whatever is new in the ecosystem. So you see, even keeping things the way they are can make in time your application less maintainable because of the growth of technical debt. So it always grows. That's why we should always, whenever we manage work, whatever uh, kind of um, approach we take, if it's agile or if it's waterfall, we don't even care how we manage 
our uh, application uh, in terms of the tasks we implement. We have probably a way that, that we use. We should always keep in mind that, that solving technical debt should always be part of our day-to-day -day work. One of the easiest rules that you should apply as software developers is the Boy Scout rule. The Boy Scout rule states that whenever you work on something new or fixing a bug, whenever you work on a task, if you see something that is unrelated uh, to your task, but it's something that you could easily solve, you solve it with that task. If it's something that's big enough that would affect, say, your estimations, uh, and it, it can't be managed directly in the task that you solve at the moment, you can anytime put it in your uh, gyro or whatever you use to manage your backlog and you can take it later and, and solve it, but you need to at least report that something that you have found. Reporting that something that should be solved uh, will allow you to easier plan your work, uh, measure the technical depth and depending on, on your measurements decide how you should act to be as efficient as possible and when i discuss efficiency i mean having a profitable software whenever we build software the reason we build software is to automate some kind of work so that uh, it takes uh, less time it's easier and faster and through the uh, time uh, that we uh, spare, we uh, gain, we, we, we help that organization using the software gain money. So we rise the profit of the company by making sure that they have uh, in a medium to long term uh, less, um, uh, less spending money, of course. Uh, so when, when is a software profitable when you can, of course, when, when, you, when it's used to spend, to spare as much time as possible and it, it, um, you, you benefit, your organization actually benefits out of it more. When is the software non-profitable anymore? When it's maintenance and development costs more than the profit it, uh, it creates. So whenever we end up at some point where a software um, costs more to maintain and implement than it produces, we say that that's a non-profitable software and at that point you may end up needing to, um, if possible, correct it to make it profitable again. Uh, if, uh, if not, um, well, you have to rewrite it, which is some kind of um, uh, sentence that sometimes I have to give as a software consultant to my clients. They don't like it, but if you are not careful with technical debt, then you will end up having to do that at some point. And at that, that moment, it might be even catastrophic for an organization. I have seen startups actually being bankrupt because of the poorly way their software has been managed. So you, technical debt is a serious matter. Um, you have to make sure that you consider it. Otherwise, you might really end up, for your organization, it might really end up pretty bad. So what I'm teaching you today is how to manage this technical debt and how to benefit out of it so that you end up with profitable software and you know that you will never end up in a situation where you get at least technically bankrupt. Technical bankruptcy is the situation where the software cannot be enhanced anymore and has to be completely rewritten. Uh, another characteristic that is very dangerous of the technical debt is that it is silent, uh, meaning that it grows. I will show you a graphic later on in my presentation. It grows and its, its curve is a um, logarithmical one. So it, it continuously growing, 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 growing. And at some point it's very high. The problem is that you might end up discovering it uh, at the very last point when it, it becomes uh, being visible through its consequences. If you end up at that moment, it might already be too late. So that's why one of the advice I have for you is that you should always 
consider technical debt up front, so don't wait till the moment uh, when it's already too late. It's like whenever whenever you have an illness, there are illnesses uh, that you, you will discover at the very end uh, when you, you all, when it's already too late and you, you might not be able to solve it anymore. And that's why we uh, frequently go to a doctor, take medical exams so that we, should, we, we see in time if, if we have a problem and we can correct it early on. Uh, if we do that, we have a chance of solving our problems. If we end up going to the doctor only when we have symptoms, it might be already too late. The same can happen with an application, okay? Very important. Um, it becomes more and more dangerous with time. That was what I was explaining is point number three. So I think we can skip over it from time to time, guys. I will stop and take your questions. I already see some question, Anthony, uh, off topic question. Leave it please in a comment section of a video or on LinkedIn and I will answer it to you. Otherwise, um, it will interrupt the subject of today's video. Um, story number one, the Italian startup. So uh, of course, I will not give names of my clients because it's against my contracts and it would not be uh, anyway uh, okay from any point of view to, to use any kind of company names of, or people that I have worked with. But uh, in during this presentation, I will tell you more stories about different companies that I have worked with as a consultant. You know, guys, I'm a software consultant uh, and software developer as well, so I work with and I worked with a lot of companies and uh, in many cases I had to um, deal with situations that were unfortunate or where I didn't have the possibility to give uh, more um, a solution rather than, than um, having to, to tell my clients that they have to, to rewrite their software. And um, for this, this case, so I remember it was it was a startup um, managed by some um, uh, guys in Italy, uh, and it was somewhere in the finance uh, sector. But that's kind of irrelevant. The idea is that uh, when I when I when I had to to consult them, it, it was because it it it, it was already. Um, in, the implementation was already starting to become very difficult and the, the reason was actually the, the code was really, really poorly written. I don't go into details how it ended up like that. In most cases, when I find clients with a very, very poorly written code base is because they either had managers and architects trying to push the developers and maybe they hired from the beginning unexperienced developers, uh, maybe they didn't have an experience, the dev lead or architect to manage the project. There are plenty of reasons when this happens uh, for why, why it happens. And if it ends up at a point where you have too much code application, you, you have vulnerabilities, you use deprecated versions of uh, frameworks and libraries, uh, it can be that and you don't have tests, if you don't have integration tests and unit tests or end-to-end -end tests, it may happen at some point that you end up uh, having to rewrite completely that software. So this story number one is to, to uh, scare you a little bit. So I, I was there uh, whenever I, I do consultancy because people ask me, and, and I will have a different video on consultancy in general. People tend to believe that when, when a client asks me something like a question, I give them the answer and then they uh, they pay me the money and that, that's it, that's consultancy. That's not software consultancy. I do study a lot of the system. I try to find out everything possible and then I come with multiple solutions that I explain. In this case, I didn't find, I, I calculated, I, I tried to financially calculate and put the numbers together and I, I couldn't find another solution that was better than rewriting. Unfortunately, their budget was no longer, uh, with their budget was no longer possible to rewrite. So um, they, of course, the, the board of executives at that point, they were kind of in a negation. They didn't like my solution. And they, they asked for a second advice, so they, they actually quit using my services. Uh, 
which is not bad. Uh, it's, I mean, you can always, and I do advise anyone, whenever you feel you don't have the right solution, always find uh, also a second advice. I'm not sure who they ask for the second advice for, and, and I don't think it's important for our story here. The idea is that um, my, my, uh, my solution was that they should have rewritten the software it was no alternative way i couldn't find a solution they of course enter the negation because usually when when you have to face this kind of a situation and where, where you don't have anything to do um uh, psychologically the first thing is to uh to enter a negation phase uh and then you realize in time that of course you you can't do anything about it because it's not not literally your decision anyway somewhere like a year later they went completely bankrupt so i i, I heard that later months from the moment uh, i concluded my collaboration with them uh that they in the end went bankrupt so uh in the end my calculations were correct I usually do uh, have a lot of uh, empirical experience, so uh, it sound, it's it, I, I don't want to, to sound absolute, but it's very unlikely that I'm very wrong. Uh, I can be wrong like anyone else. I, I do mis I, I make mistakes and I, I, I can be wrong, but it's very unlikely that I'm very uh, much off. So technical that can have severe consequences. I know this, it's not the only collaborator I had uh, and it, it can happen uh, and you should know it's, it's real, stuff is real. So that's why it's a very important point you need to consider. This is the graphic that I was telling, telling you about earlier. So uh, the, the technical debt is logarithmic. It means it, it basically um, uh, ends up getting close to an asymptote and it, it's basically getting closer and closer. Um, the idea is that because of the way it looks like, you can see that it starts and it, for a long time, it, it grows very, very slowly. And then at some point, phew, it goes up. So that's the problem is that because it grows slowly, you might, uh, you, you might not be aware of it and especially if, if you are not an experienced de developer you might not see it you might not know it's there and whenever you find out oh technical debt is there it's already very very high so you want to when, whenever it's very close to the asymptote that's when you you are in technical bankruptcy if you find technical debt and try to manage it earlier then you will not get into technical uh, bankruptcy so that's what you want to do with your software. You want to be very careful to carefully use your technical debt and manage it in such a way in which you never get into technical bankruptcy. Let me see how, what other questions you have. Cause I see that you might have some very interesting questions in the live chat. How to convince my lead of the dangers of technical debt? They just want to move fast and not consider it at all. So I, I will answer here from two perspectives. I, I really like your questions. Your question is a really, really good one. And I bet this happens to a lot of you guys. Maybe some of you really know about technical debt. Maybe, maybe some of you really see the consequences even in their application and nobody listens to you. Did it ever happen to you? I guess it might, you, you might have faced this. I faced this so many times. Let me answer you from two perspectives. Uh, from the uh, consultant perspective and from the development the developer perspective. So from the consultant perspective being, and again, I will have a separate video where I will discuss uh, what, what consultancy means in, um, in software development. But as a consultant, I'm like the doctor, you know, when you go to the doctor and let's say you have some problems, some health problems, and the doctor tells you, well, you have a very high uh, sugar in your blood, uh, you might end up with diabetes and they advise you to avoid uh, eating sweet, maybe uh, be careful with your fats, fat the fats you eat. And then, then the next thing you do is uh, uh, go to, to some restaurant and uh, take a nice Coke and uh, eat, uh, I don't know, something like a kebab, which is very fatty. 
if you do that, I mean, it's your choice. Your, your doctor will not care about that. They gave you the advice. They told you what you should do to stay healthy. They told you you have some problems. And if you don't do that, you will probably end up with, uh, with heavy health, health problems and you will probably die sooner. Uh, if, but the doctor can't stop you uh, taking their advice seriously. So if you don't take their advice seriously and you, can, you can't stop eating sugar and uh, fatty foods, uh, it's not the doctor's fault. So that's, that's exactly as a consulting software development. I consult my client. I'm telling them what's wrong with their software. I try explaining them what's wrong with their software as much as I can. I give them multiple solutions to their problems so they, they have wherever possible, of course, but usually I end up with multiple solutions and I'm telling them which is the one that I prefer, what are the consequences, presumably to each of the solutions and they might end up not listening to me. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, if they don't, don't listen to me, they will end up like the guys in story number one, being bankrupt or something like that. They will lose money. Maybe they will, instead of being more profitable, they will end up being less profitable. There are things that can happen. There are some of them, they are worse. Some of them, they are bad. They are not, not that, that, uh, that bad. But of course, that can happen. From a software consultant point of view, I don't care. I'm like the doctor. I tell them how should things be. And in the end, it's their organization, it's their software. It will not impact me. For me, there will still be a thousand more projects out there to help. Uh, so not that bad. From a software developer point of view, I have my uh, own way of working where I, I do avoid, well, I do avoid doing things uh, on a longer time that are messy. So when, when I think that, that uh, the things I do are messy, I try to work them properly. What can happen is that, of course, whenever you work properly uh, and you don't do things like we were doing them in the faculty where you write a project and then you present it and next day you, have, you, you can throw it out, you don't need it anymore. I know that whenever I, I build software for a real organization, software that costs millions or billions of dollars, uh, I should do it properly. So I, I do work properly. And what happens is that uh, I usually spend time, probably I spend more time than, than it would take if I would build it like when I was in faculty, definitely. Uh, I need to, to review, to iterate over it multiple times. Probably I have a code review step that I, that I need to take care of. I have to write my, my unit and integration tests. Um, I have to see if, uh, if Sonar or any other static analysis tool tells me I'm doing something wrong. And uh, at that, that time, uh, I, I do spend, besides the real development, at least the same time, maybe making sure the software is good. Someone can tell me, like my manager can tell me, why are you working so slow? And I simply tell them, that's how I'm working. And what, what can happen? It's like, the only thing it can happen is that they kick me out of the project. That's the really worst thing that can happen. To be honest, never happened to me, even if I were like this. Uh, and if it happens, like, again, there are a thousand projects out there. I'm working in software, man. So I, I, I really am not worried if I'm kicked out of a project, honestly. So I'm not sure how other developers are working, but I always try to do the things from uh, the, the good, the, the, uh, to, to be a, a, a good developer and do the things the right way. Okay. So that's, that's how I convince, try convincing them. I tell them what things are and they might listen or they might not listen, but I cannot force them to do things the way I think they are the best. They will end up figuring out at some point if they do, don't do that. I just try to do my, the, my, my job very well. I really like your videos and they are very consistent. Thank you very much. I'm glad to hear that I was working at Endava as automation and now I'm a dev. That's, I think that's, that's good. Since then I've watched your internal. Thank you. Okay. That's not the question, but I really, really, uh, I'm really thankful to, to hear this kind of feedback. So I'm really happy that you guys find my content helpful and that it really helps you. 
Now, I will continue my presentation, but please do leave your questions in, in, the, in the chat if you have some more questions. Uh, and of course, I will make a second break and then try to answer them. So, um, you know already, and that's something we just discussed, that you will always have technical depth. What do you do if you are smart? If you are a smart folk, guy or girl, doesn't matter. What do you do? When you know you have something that will happen uh, and you cannot get completely read out of it, you of course try to use it. If you have something uh, and in, you know it will happen, you try to make that thing beneficial for you. you. You try to, instead of seeing it as a monstrous disease, seeing it from the capabilities they might give you. And now, what I will try to do is make you, is, is um, um, describe you a different perspective of the technical depth. So let's say we leave aside the perspective of uh, technical depth being an illness. And let's think that you uh, want to buy a new house, buy a new home, and you, you really found the, the, the house of your dreams, it, it looks exactly the way you, you liked it, and you, you, you would like to move there, uh, it's nice house, big, uh, nice, uh, nice garden, it's exactly the way you dreamt it, but, and there is a but. It costs a lot of money and you don't have that money. What do you do? What, what can you do in that case? Are there any possibilities to get over this? And of course, there are possibilities. You can go to the bank, you can take a loan, and then you buy the house of your dreams. So, this alternative doesn't mean it's perfect. It has some things, some consequences, some things you need to consider before you do that. Like, will I be able to pay my debt back to the bank? Uh, can I afford the loan that I'm, that I'm taking to buy that house? You will not be able to take an infinite amount of money. You have a limitation. And that's something you will consider. But is that possible? Can you, in some situations, use a loan to uh, achieve one of your dreams, a new house or a new car, of course you can. And that's one of the other perspectives you, you can uh, apply for a technical depth. And be before going further and describing further uh, how this picture, how this new picture of the technical depth may, uh, can, can be viewed, let me tell you a second story that you will have we will help with this perspective. So I had some point, some client that was using a third party software. Uh, again, somewhere around uh, finance, uh, the finance department of, of an organization. I don't know if that's relevant or not. The idea is that they were, they were using a third party. And at some point in my experience, long time ago, I, I was even, um, implementing this kind of software myself. And I'm, to be honest, I don't really like this kind of software for a big organization. Uh, usually it's difficult to manage. Now, this, uh, this client of mine, what, what happened? Um, they figured out that uh, using that third-party software is difficult for them because uh, the implementation is very slow. Why is that slow? If you look from, from the perspective of the uh, creator, the, the, the developer of the third-party software, what they do usually is that they, they have one software that have to um, serve multiple clients. But the businesses are very different and there is one rule with the business. Whenever you have a competition, you create competition, you take decisions, some decisions that you take in your organization as a business, uh, man, uh, they are different than other organizations and depending on how good your decisions are, you will be better than, than your competition or not, uh, which is called business strategy. Business strategies differ from one organization to another. Uh, 
Maybe it's less visible when the organization is small, but when the organization is big, it's, it's very relevant and it can cost money or it can bring you high advantage over your competition. Uh, so being that said, the software will not match either. So the third party developer will have to always customize things for all their clients. And the more clients they have, the more difficult will be to manage all the possible customizations. And the more difficult it becomes to manage the software, the more bugs the application has, the more costly it is to implement and support and so on and so on and slower of course it is to, to implement as well. So in most cases big organizations will tend creating their own software which will of course help them apply their business strategy. Uh, and that, that's what happened here. So they, they all, the, this organization grew and at some point they had to quit their third party software and create their own. But there is a big problem with this. And the big problem is uh, third party software in such situations, it, it doesn't cost uh, a small amount of money. It actually costs a lot of money and you usually buy a license for a long time. So if you buy a license for at least one year or so. And it might cost millions of dollars. And that's the problem. The problem is how do you implement some software in such a way in which your client doesn't have to pay that much for a long time of having their third party software because they want to invest at least a part of that money in building their own. And they don't want to pay double because then it's very difficult. Maybe they can't even afford to pay double. It's because again, we talk about a very large amount of money. Uh, you can find ways of doing that. Of course, building software is not, uh, is not uh, easy and it takes time, but you can benefit from technical debt. You know, it's called a debt for a reason. It's called a debt because it, it actually works exactly like the debt from a bank. Just that you take it from your technical work. So that's why it's a technical debt. Whenever you leave technical debt behind, you will pay it later and you will pay it more than what you borrowed, uh, like you do with the money you, you, you uh, get from a bank. Whenever you, you get from a bank uh, an amount of money, you will later pay a lot more. That's how debts work in general. And that's how technical debt works also. You can, however, measure it like you do when you take money from a bank. You might want to see, uh, will I be able to pay that debt if I take it to buy a new house or a new car or whatever my dream is? How much can I borrow from the bank so that I can end up uh, still being able to pay it and I will not get bankrupt myself. If you know how to calculate that, you might do the same thing with software. You can use technical debt like debt from bank by leaving it behind, but making sure that you have a very well defined plan uh, to uh, solve it later so that you don't get bankrupt in the end. You must know how much technical debt you afford and then you must know how much will you have to pay later. So in that case, this is a success story. Actually, story number one was not a success one. Story number two is a success story. We managed to use technical debt such in a way in which we could build the minimum part of the software they needed up to the moment they had to pay for another license. We did that by knowingly leave technical debt in our application so we borrowed time through technical debt and then we established how we will pay back the technical debt in the next year after the release and we managed to pay it back and we managed to end up with a stable application and we managed to also get rid of the third party software so the dream of our client has been established and you can do that 
the same, but you have to be careful. Just be careful when you borrow things because you have to pay them back and it will cost you more. But if you make the calculations right, then you will end up profitable in the end on a medium to long term. So rule number one is that you have to know your debt. You have to know it. You have to know how much you borrow. If you continue, imagine you as a, as a person, you go and continue borrowing money from friends. Hey, please, this, please give me some money to buy some cigarettes. Please give me some money to buy a beer. Please give me some money to this, this, this. And you keep borrowing money and you don't even remember who you own what. At some point, you will end up bankrupt. Nobody will give you money. People will start asking you back the money. Uh, it's not a way to, to deal with things. And if it's not a way to deal with things in the real world, then it's not a way to deal with things in software either. You have to know your debt. Always measure it. Make sure you put it in your backlog. I'm not sure if Jira is what you use, but that's what I'm using in, and I've, what I've been using in most of the apps. But put it in your backlog, whatever your backlog is managed with. Make sure you know everything. Whenever you leave behind, you put it there so you are aware. You mark it specifically. You can count them. You can take reports out of your backlog and see how much debt did you acquire and so on and so forth. The first rule, make sure you know your debt. debt. Like sickness in your body, go to the doctor, make sure you frequently take medical exams so you know if you have debt in case of your, if, of your health, so that you don't end up later on finding out that you have something whenever it's already too late to uh, heal. Same with software, find it out upfront, know what you do whenever you on purpose do that, make sure that you register it so you always know what's wrong with your software and then you can have a plan of managing it in a decent time. Because technical debt always exists, you might must always make sure that you allocate uh, time each and every sprint, say if you work agile, um, to solve the problems your software has. If you only work on delivering business implementation, but you don't schedule uh, work on technicalities of your application, like version upgrades, like clean coding, addressing feedback from Sonar, or whatever other software you use for statical code analysis, and stuff like that. You will end up bank uh, technically bankrupt at some point. Your software actually will end up being technically bankrupt. And you don't want that. So you really, aside from the business implementations you have, we all know when we build software, we build it from, for some business reasons. Remember, they are not the only work to be done in a piece of software. If you don't address technical debt every now and then, if you don't have it on your table as business as usual way of working, you will forget about it. You will find out too late about it and then you, you will end up technically bankrupt. And rule number three, which is continuously measure the debt and analyze the risk. So first of all, you know about it, you register it, you make sure you have a plan on how to solve it continuously. And then you always calculate it, measure the depth somehow, find out what your risk is. So you know, whenever you would be over the threshold allowed and you are leading your software to, uh, to bankruptcy, or when we are doing well, it doesn't mean you will ever have software that is completely out of technical debt. That's not your point either. And further on in the discussion, we'll discuss also about this kind of aspect. Technical debt will always exist. The problem is not when it exists and it's minimal. If it exists, it's minimal, you measure it. You always consider it 
uh, as a business as usual process and solve it during your normal work besides the of course business cases that you implement then it's fine you have a normal software normal software has technical debt the problem is not it being there is the amount of debt and the fact that's not being managed you always have to measure new debt you find it you if you and, and cannot solve it you register it in your backlog make sure that your product backlog contains everything possible you have discovered uh, you make sure that when you take a decision of postponing technical debt you uh, write down that decision and you have it always somewhere there um, and calculate the risk uh, on what what happens if you leave this and that depending on what you leave the risk can be greater or smaller so i cannot i cannot give you an equation on how to measure risk or debt uh, but uh, you can and later on empirically you will find out ways on how to understand that in your system and make sure that you you, uh, you measure it continuously and you know how much debt you need to take. If, if you see that something happens and you have to have a couple or, or two of sprints, uh, a couple or three, or three sprints where you only solve technical debt, then you should do that if that, that's the, the way to go. But usually if you work in a normal with a normal approach in a normal system, you will just end up continuously having tasks in the same sprint where you solve business cases but you also have some time allocated for technical debt and then as long as you keep it keep it stable uh, that's fine and then you of course have the urgency remember some things are more urgent than others some things are more important than others so you always have to keep in mind what's the urgency of your of your tasks and in this case specifically related to technical debt you might know this separation the four squares urgent and important not urgent but important urgent but not important and not urgent and not important based on how you label your tasks you will always take first the important ones definitely and then the urgent ones and then at the very end the ones that are not urgent and not important although they might sound simple the common mistake i see in uh, managing software is that sometimes developers uh, take the non not urgent and not important ones because they are they are easy to solve and they they want to figure out that they solve something that's print uh, but that's not necessarily good for the whole project uh, and of course remember that urgent but not important it's always at the end so it's uh, it's first you first of what's important urgent and not important can stay after not urgent and important so let me take some more questions i see uh, in the live chat here and then i will continue my discussion pushing deadline is toxic and i'm slow and i was blamed by my manager you don't have to care if you are blamed by anyone i mean blamed for what for working well working slow but that's what we had to do i mean imagine you can tell that story well you go to a mechanic and you want to uh, repair your car and the mechanic tells you that they can solve it in two weeks you they can fix your car in two weeks but you say well i have to go somewhere in one week please do it in one week otherwise i'm going to another mechanic the guy might fool you and solve it in one week but then when whenever you go you will be back to to that same mechanic or another in a couple of weeks because it's your 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 car will probably crash again what would you prefer leave your car at the mechanic for a couple of weeks rather than a week uh, and make sure that the the uh, car is well repaired or force push the mechanic solve it faster and might end up going back and spending even more money that's what you can you can ask your manager now you used to work on a program with little knowledge having a lot of side effects and then dubs with bugs and you were a rookie it, that that tells us even more one of the main and i will create a separate video on that because it's a long story but I, I just want to be short with answering your question now whenever you are a good manager meaning team lead technical lead 
IT manager. Organizations have different ways to, to name them. And you manage people. You, one of the keys characteristics is how, how to manage your team based on their knowledge and experience. So if you were a rookie and you were put on a difficult project and the, then your manager even told you that uh, you why, and, and asked you that why, why are you pushing the deadline or why, why are you working slow, that's not a good manager. So the problem is not on your side, it's on their side. But again, I will create a separate video on, uh, on the regards of managing software projects. Um, what to do uh, for an app with technical bankruptcy, rewrite the application? Uh, very good question. Sometimes you can, you can take it slower and rewrite it step by step instead of having to completely rewrite it at the same time that you have to identify key points that are still working fine and you can keep. In most cases, this is very difficult. So whenever I end up with technical bankruptcy, usually it's about having to take it from scratch because it takes more time to correct the code you have than uh, rewrite it from the beginning. That's why it's important software has to be kept out of ending up in technical bankruptcy in the first place. Uh, and then in the first, uh, in the fast paced industry, we often just end up with a rewrite than a refactor. Yes, that's, that's true. And that's also what I was uh, saying. Um, good. So I see these are all the questions for now, and we can go to our next part of the discussion, uh, which is what happens when you try to completely get rid out of technical debt. I, I want to conclude this presentation by also telling you that uh, considering taking completely out technical debt is not realistic. Because sometimes when I discuss technical debt and sometimes when books, articles and other tutorials discuss technical debt, they, they discuss it as something bad that you can get rid of and you should get rid of. While I was already telling you that technical debt in my perspective is not something that you will ever be completely able to get rid of, even if it's not good, it can be managed and you can even use it wisely. Uh, start from the conclusion that you will never be able to completely get rid of technical debt. The point of today's discussion is that to make you aware that you have to consider it and keep it at a normal level so that you don't have, end up in technical bankruptcy. That's good. But don't try to go on the other way around where you um, spend too much time on technical debt either. Spending too much time on technical debt uh, is, is on the other hand not beneficial either. So. Uh, I think I should stay, uh, say the story first and then go to the next slide. Um, so at some point, and I, I was uh, also employed by an organization to audit a few teams that were working on a, on a product of theirs. And the problem of, of their manager was that their um, developers were very slow and when, whenever I hear that I'm kind of smiling because I know all managers they always think that developers are slow because they always want things to be done fast with high quality uh, without if possible with a small amount of money and in a shorter time that's the re recipe that's in mind of any stakeholder they that's what they want they will probably it's of course uh, not not possible but but I, I know that and whenever I hear that, it's not a surprise for me um, uh, anymore. But it, for, for that, for that specific product, I have analyzed what developers were doing and we ended up concluding that they had too many steps that they were actually considering for their pipeline for the product they were delivering. So they were taking as an inspiration the philosophy of delivering very high critical products, software products, such as medical software products or um, airplane software, 
uh, where being very cautious is really important. Whenever you test software for an airplane, you make sure, you make really sure more teams have tested it and there is no bug whenever they, they will go in production. It's tested, uh, it's in simulations first, it's, it's a lot of tests being uh, there uh, involved because, be, before it's ever released. That's why uh, when, whenever a few years ago there was a problem with some uh, um, airplane model from Boeing, if you remember, uh, and a couple of planes, a couple of planes crashed. So there were, there were a couple of planes, I think one was in Malaysia and the other one I don't remember exactly, a lot of people died. Uh, and that was because the, the plane was not properly using some sensors and so it was basically a software problem because the software was not right, correctly implemented. Now, of course, the problems there started first of all on, and the, the, the first question should have been how the heck did that software end up on a plane without being so roughly tested? So um, implementing very well-defined software and testing very well the software is really important when you have critical software. But there, are, there is software out there that if you have a bug or something, you deliver it with a bug, in worst case scenario, you can lose some money, okay? But it's, it's not that big deal. So whenever you have such kind of a software, let's say you, you, build, you build YouTube, Okay, if you build YouTube and some bug has been released and for some reason, I don't know, the tool showing the graphic of audience is not working well anymore. It's a problem, of course, it's a big one, but it's not such a high, highly critical one as compared to what happens when you deliver software not working on a plane. So you have to measure and to make sure that the strategy you apply for your pipeline of development matches well with the kind of software, because sometimes in specific software, it makes more sense to add risk on delivering buggy software. So you, you risk on delivering problems in production rather than uh, making sure you don't deliver, but spending five or 10 times more time in development. So don't try to polish for technical depth where it's, it doesn't make sense. Make sure on the software you have, what is the threshold of technical depth you allow. Uh, and make sure that you don't try to polish uh, it too much, spending time if that really doesn't bring you a, a, a good advantage that really makes sense. In the case of this, this uh, organization, uh, the problem was that developers had too many things to do, uh, which indeed, in the end, you ended up with almost a perfect software in production. But it didn't really make sense, because when we changed that, after six months, because what, what, what I do is also I measure then what happens. When I, when I decide some change, I, I measure what happens. Did I see, I try to see if I did something wrong or not, because sometimes you do things empirically and uh, in software, it's not always, don't always have an equation. Uh, and and I, I changed their delivery pipeline. I make, made it much shorter. That also implied more risk to the delivery, but I knew the software was not critical. So we ended up in the end, with a software or of almost the same quality from the user's point of view, the, the feedbacks were really good, and the time of, was, of development was three times less. So, when you have technical depth and problems, that doesn't mean that you try to always figure out to have a perfect software, because that's most likely something that uh, is not possible to achieve, and doesn't make sense. When you are an IT manager, you try to create an environment of working according to all the variables you have, including the risks and the kind of software you build to be profitable. Because in the end, what you want is that your organization is profitable on the software you deliver, okay? So that's where you have to find the, the right balance. 
Now about the tools that we use to measure. One advice I have is never use only one tool. Uh, try to have different ways of measuring technical depth. I'm using uh, for static code analysis on RQ, but I'm also using code reviews uh, and um, um, developers as being a factor of deciding technical depth, the team itself. Uh, I'm using issues in my software that I use to manage my backlog uh, and I mark them accordingly and that's how I also see the technical depth. So I do use multiple indicators uh, and based on multiple indicators, I decide the risks and stuff like that and how long I estimate how long will take me to solve what I need to solve. I estimate the urgency and the importance um, and the amount of, of tasks with different importance that I have and so on and so forth. Now, conclusions are that technical debt is dangerous if you don't manage it right. Um, but you can use the technical debt as a tool like you do with getting debt from a bank. And then you can borrow technical debt as long as you make sure that you really well manage it and you pay it back as soon as possible so that, that you don't end up with a bankrupt software. You need to always measure it throughout working on your software. It has to be part of your day-to-day -day work, so-called business as, as usual. Only implementing business cases is not the only thing that a developer does. Uh, so do have it always in mind and make sure technical debt is considered and solved throughout your working process. And don't forget, remember that you, you have to always think about the importance and then the urgency of what you use. And that's basically it, guys. And let me actually take a few more minutes now the time to uh, answer the last questions you have if you have and then of course i will thank you again for being here with me and um, hope to see you for other videos and uh, and events so i don't have a lot of other questions as i remember the joke from this manager will always think that nine women can deliver a baby in one month of course they they uh, do that that's another story actually that's that's a, a story that i can take in a video if you are interested in a video related to how you manage a project uh, it's not directly related to technical debt but of course wrong management of software can uh, affect uh, the software and can of course imply um, you will have more technical debt but in terms of managing software, I do agree with what you say. The um, parallelization of tasks is not always possible. So it means that some tasks cannot be taken by, by multiple developers. And the assumption of a lot of unexperienced IT managers that they can, if, if, whenever you, you add, like you double the, the number, if you have three developers and they, they deliver uh, the they, they deliver the software in uh, one month in, in three months if you if you have nine developers they will deliver it in one month so that's that's, that's not working like that is not linear okay it's some it's still asymptotic so it's, at some point you you uh, I mean, it doesn't really matter how many developers you add to the team you will still have uh, and, and you even might get on the downside because you have now uh, heavier communication and stuff like that. So <laughs> uh, that, that's again a different end. Uh, to tell you uh, a last joke and um, that's related to, to your comment is the same is um, if you always go to a concert, uh, an, an orchestra concert, uh, let's say uh, the seasons for Vivaldi, uh, they are played by 60 musicians in one hour. How long does it take it to be um, uh, to be uh, sang in 30, in uh, 30 minutes? Or, or how, how long does it take it if, if we have 120 uh, musicians singing it? Of course, it will take the same time <laughs> because the, the, the uh, um, musical sheet is the same. Cool. Then, thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you again for being here with me. I hope this discussion was also valuable for you again. And uh, I'm really looking forward to see you again for next events and maybe in person sometimes. Until then, have an excellent time for study further. 